Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for being here. Let me just add my, my sincere words of thanks to, to what Baruch has already said and, and to the NAS staff who have done an unbelievable job putting this together. Thank you for being here. Um, I want to expand a little bit on what Baruch has already talked about and shift our focus to, to the societal level, to the political level. Um, wondering what will happen once science, or if science, or when science, rather, uh, is being debated in these environments. And I want to highlight two different things. Um, a, I want to talk about the, the challenges that we face when science shifts to these environments, because I think there's a unique set of challenges that we're facing um, in society. And then a, and a second um, set of, 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 of points I want to address maybe some of the same intuitions that, that other speakers have talked about, that, that Baruch has talked about and other speakers will be talking about, um, and give, us, give you a little bit of the preview of the social science you'll see over the course of the next few days, um, next two days, um, that tell us if these things really work out the way we think they do. So let me start with the challenges, and, and because I do think we're, we're operating in a very, very unique environment. The interesting thing about, about science, particularly in the US, but everywhere else in the world as well, is that, that we're, we're dealing with a strange paradox between, on the one hand, a, 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 a scientific enterprise and a, and, a, and a political enterprise that believes in the value of science, and on the other hand, a society that, that's not always on board with some of those premises. And, and if you look at, at, at politics, if you look at economics, if you look at a, a whole range of other areas in the US, most of them agree that, that science is absolutely critical to our global leadership. Uh, global leadership, and, and I'm not going to read out the quotes here, but global leadership to, to, to national security, excuse me, to military, to economics, corporations telling us, look, if, if you don't get this right, we may have to go elsewhere. And of course, an increasingly competitive global environment where China, um, India, Russia, Europe are all giving us a run for our money. In fact, for the area of nanotechnology for the first time, maybe even outdoing us on patents and IP. On the flip side, um, you have a public, and that graph on the left is not supposed to be large enough for you to read. The, the point from that graph, though, is it's a study, a comparative study of 34 countries um, that looks at, at public acceptance of evolution as one of the best explanatory models for how life has developed on Earth. And the two countries at the very bottom are the US and Turkey um, in a comparison of 34 countries. And we have the, the same disconnects for evolution, for global warming, for stem cell research. But I don't want to just put blame on the public, and there's some um, blame that I will put on the public, but I don't want the theme, or I'm hoping that the theme for the next two days is not to say, well, the public just doesn't know much, and we're going to fix that. I'll come back to that point. There is, though, some blame for the public, and I think I want to talk about three factors that, that explain it a little bit. Number one, the idea that most of us know very little about science, and that's not too surprising. It's not new. We've known this for a long time. Other areas, politics, for instance, most of us go to the voting booth and don't necessarily have a full understanding of, of, the, of the political issues um, and, or the party platforms even. So that's not extremely surprising. What's more tricky and what's, what's more disturbing maybe is the idea that our infrastructure for learning is maybe not as developed as it should be. Um, if we look at surveys consistently, they show that about half of Americans don't know why they celebrate their birthday once a year. And that number, in fact, is a little bit inflated because the question is only asked for people who know that the Earth goes around the sun in the first place. Everybody else doesn't even get the question. One in five Americans knows what a scientific study is. Um, so they, even if, if you wanted to explain to, to, to a lot of people what a scientific study is or scientific evidence is, the infrastructure for learning is missing. Now, all of that is exacerbated by the fact that we're not really paying a lot of attention to science either. Um, it's always been low. One in five Americans in the mid-90s said we're paying a lot of attention to, they're paying a lot of attention to science. That number has decreased even further. So that's kind of the, 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 the weird paradox that we're dealing with. And that brings a number of challenges uh, uh, and, and this, uh, as far as the public goes. The second challenge, really, uh, that we're dealing with is the science itself. And on the left here, I, I, I put a picture of a, of a shape-shifting robot that's been developed by the folks at iRobot with DARPA funding. Um, and that stands really for a new type of science that we're dealing with. Mike Rocco and others at the National Science Foundation have referred to NBIC technologies, nano, bio, info, cogno technologies. So technologies that bring together area of re areas of research and develop new areas of research, synthetic biology, information technologies, big data, um, nanotechnology. So these new areas that share one particular characteristic that's important for the, for the purpose of our colloquium, 
and that is that they bring with them a, a unique set of what's called ethical, legal, and social implications. Concerns that are related to these technologies. Do we really want to do the science? And a lot of our national surveys show that, that people very much trust us to do the science, right? They're not so sure if we should be doing certain areas of science or if we should be looking for certain applications. So again, second area of the science itself. The third area, the, the third challenge, is that the conduits that have traditionally connected lay publics to the science are rapidly going away. Um, we're tracking at, at Wisconsin, for instance, uh, uh, the news coverage on nanotechnology for the last 20, 30 years, and we're tracking also how many people, these are the number of writers, how many people have written a given number of articles, 25 or more articles over the 20, last 20 years, or who every so often writes about nano. And the key thing is if you look at the folks who've actually written more than 25 pieces, meaning who are writing routinely about science, who understand the science and are able to, to competently convey it, that number is fairly small. It's only seven people. And technically it's only five because two of these folks, Rick Weiss and Barnaby Fader from the Post and the Times respectively, have since then left their papers. So the number of even the, the most prominent writers for the large papers is, is shrinking and the conduits that are able to translate 10 years, 20 years of research into 300 words or less are increasingly going away. So that infrastructure is missing. So let me shift then to a few intuitive assumptions that we often make about what the solutions can be and tell you for each of these assumptions really quickly um, what maybe the social science says and what we'll see over the course of the next two days about the social science at the macro level um, about will they work or will they not work. Assumption number one refers to what many of you know, the knowledge deficit model. So the idea that, uh, that, that knowledge deficits are responsible for a lack of public support. And there's different labels for the knowledge deficit, but they all make the same point. Uh, familiarity hypothesis, knowledge deficit, they all assume one thing. Um, if people only knew more about the science, they would be more supportive of the scientific enterprise overall. And that really effective communication it's just making sure that we teach people the science. Um, and there's a, 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 this is extremely important, obviously, teaching the science. The assumption, though, that that immediately translates into support, especially for these complex NBIC technologies, um, is not really supported by most research out there. Let me just show you one particular piece. Um, this is public opinion data on, on embryonic stem cell research linking on the, on the x-axis here uh, scientific knowledge. So we give people quiz-type questions that they can answer true or false, and then they get a knowledge score. Um, for the sake of, 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 of simplicity here, I've grouped people into folks who don't know a lot and folks who do know a lot objectively, and then their attitudes on embryonic stem cell research. And you see that positive link, very much that, uh, that um, the, the deficit model would predict, meaning the more we know, the more supportive we get, at least for folks who say that, they're, that, they, that they are less religious, who report lower levels of religiosity. For folks with higher levels of religiosity, there's actually an absolute flat line. This doesn't necessarily say that religion undermines attitudes. That's not what this graph shows. It shows it to some degree, but more importantly, this graph shows that knowledge for these folks doesn't matter. It's one thing that they take into account, but it's, it gets discounted based on other types of, 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 of shortcuts or other types of, 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 uh, of considerations that they take into account, <laughs> as I'm being attacked by a fly here. Um, so the, the important part here really being that, that, that knowledge levels for some issues just don't make a difference and, and, and don't necessarily translate into, into attitudes. And that's not good or bad, that's simply an empirical description. Number two, the assumption that the public just doesn't trust scientists, that there's really not much we can do because it's really a function of trust. Um, if you look at especially some of the NBIC, NBIC technologies, nanotechnologies being a great example, uh, this is from national survey data um, asking people, who do you trust as a, as a source of information to, to tell you, for example, about the benefits of nanotechnology? Uh, and then we asked them about all these groups down here, university scientists, and so on and so forth. The, and I've ordered them based on, on size. University scientists continue to come in um, as, at, as the most trusted source. Even corporate scientists, which is a group who, for biotech and, and GMOs, we've seen further down in the list, is, are still fairly high up, and of course, news media, um, are, and this is not very surprising, are not at, at the, are, 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 are at the lower end of the scale. There's also been some arguments that trust has really declined a lot over time. Um, what I did is I, I plotted data here um, that, that the, the National Opinion uh, uh, Research Center has collected. They, they go back to the 70s, I just plotted them for the last 30 years. Trust levels. 
And these are only, the people I, I plotted here are only people um, who, who say that, they're, that they have a great deal, a great deal, so the very highest scale point of trust in the people running the following organizations. The press, and my apologies to our journalistic colleagues in the room, but uh, again, not something that's too surprising. That's always been low, and it's gotten a little bit lower. Uh, religious organization, organized religions. And then a great deal of confidence. You have two in five Americans who score at the very high end of the scale for science. So science A is among the highest and most trusted um, organizations that we have, and it really hasn't declined um, if you look at this, especially not relative to other other. Uh, groups and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and associations. Assumption number three, uh, meaningful public debate requires that citizens end up thinking exactly like scientists. Um, and this is tricky for two reasons. Number one, uh, most of us don't think like scientists, at least for the vast majority of our daily decision making. And Baruch has already talked about this, and I think we'll hear a lot about this today. People in political science have talked about the idea of low information rationality. Um, and again, Baruch just mentioned this, the idea that it, it makes rational sense for us to think a little bit like investors, or at least we do think like investors. It doesn't make too much sense for me to try and understand an issue that other people spend 20 years, 10 years of their career um, getting PhDs in. But we still form attitudes. We still have opinions about, for example, Bush's federal guidelines for stem cell research. So how do we do that? We do that in part by replacing knowledge or supplementing knowledge with heuristics, with shortcuts, with things that help us make decisions even though we don't fully understand it. And if those are values or other things, um, they're, they're important. Reason number two why this doesn't uh, make necessarily too much sense to expect uh, the public to think like scientists is because very often scientists don't think like scientists. And, and I just want to show you one quick graph here. We do surveys of, of the leading scientists in nanotechnology, for instance, on a regular basis, and we ask them, well, where do you stand on regulations? So we ask them to, to, to judge regulations in a field that, that is their area of expertise. In fact, they're the most highly cited folks. And the good news is their scientific judgments make a huge difference. We ask them long batteries of risk and benefit judgments, and the more risks they see, their scientific judgments shape if they support regulations. But so do their personal ideologies. So even the leading nanoscientists, if you're more conservative as a scientist after controlling your field of study, how long you've been in the field, your, your, your scientific judgments, your personal ideologies still shape how you think about public policy related to science. So if even the scientists think that way, we certainly need to expect the public to think the same way. And where do some of these heuristic com heuristics come from? And, and we'll hear a lot on day two about mass media. Um, the first mentions of nanotechnology came out of comic books um, more than 20 years ago. Um, they came from movies like Terminator, um, where mentions of nano way preceded most media mentions in, in, in science media and elsewhere. And that's an important thing. In communication theory, we talk very often about cultivation theory. So why is my perception of how likely I am to be a victim of a violent crime directly related to entertainment viewing? Well, because my views about violent crime and about the world out there are cultivated by the portrayals in, in entertainment media. And the same thing is true for science. Most of us don't, haven't seen a bench scientist at work. We don't know how theoretical, how, what a theoretical physicist does or how he, she behaves. But we may have seen the Big Bang Theory. And, and, and we take shortcuts from that and, and a perception of how the scientific world works from those media images. Maybe more importantly, and we talked about this briefly over, over dinner last night, maybe more importantly is a more subtle way of, um, of, of, of um, uh, influencing the public, and that's what's called framing. Um, and I, I'm gathering from the reactions that some of you have seen this before, uh, and then I think we'll see uh, at the Sackville lecture tonight some reference to this with Daniel Kahneman's work heavily ha having influenced uh, our understanding of how these processes work. Um, this is one of the more successful campaigns that Greenpeace has run on, on genetically frosted fakes, Tony the Frankentiger. Why is this so powerful? Because it has little to do with information because it takes a piece of information and it frames it or positions it in a way that it allows me to put it in one mental bucket versus the other. So by referring to Frankenstein, to Tony the Frankentiger, to, to, to all these images, I know that I'm supposed to think about this, about runaway science, about science having way overstepped its, its, its rightful role and its rightful place. The tricky part with a lot of this, of course, is that it has entered our public discourse. Um, for example, here an article from the, uh, from the Atlantic Monthly, Again, without even reading the content, without getting the scientific facts, 
I immediately get the term frankenfood and I see a stitched up carrot, which again, puts the GMO issue very clearly in one bucket versus another. It's not scientific progress that I'm thinking, it's science gone wrong that I'm thinking simply based on the way it's being presented. So framing, and we'll hear more about this over the course again of the next two days, uh, being one of the key processes in which media um, end up influencing how we think about science. Assumption number four, um, communication without empirical data is better than no communication. In other words, winging it is a good idea. Um, and, uh, and I mean, hopefully, the, 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 the already the way I've described it gives it away. Um, winging it is never a good idea. And in fact, it may have outcomes that are very unintentional and, and, and really socially not very desirable. Um, when we look, for instance, at, at, at how much people have learned, and again, on the y-axis here, you have a similar knowledge quiz to what I showed you for stem cell research, except for this time, it's for nanotechnology. Again, we asked them six different questions, and they can score, and they can get zero of them right or six of them right. And then we looked at two data points, 2004 and 2007. Overall, if you look at the literature, it says nothing has changed. And that's to some degree true, except for um, if you actually break folks down into, and for the sake of, of showing this year, we've, we've published more elaborate multivariate analyses and public understanding of science. Um, but just to, to show the dichotomy between two very extreme groups, uh, folks who've completed college or gone beyond and folks who haven't even finished high school. And what you see is a widening gap in knowledge. What you see is a widening gap in information between those who are already information rich, meaning they read the science section of the Times, they watch Nova Science, and the, and, the already, and, and the already information poor, meaning the people who in many ways we really need to reach. But those are the ones who we're not only not reaching, but as the issue of nano becomes more complex, as, as, as regulatory questions arise, as, as, as different applications happen, they actually end up understanding less about the issue. So again, not having this ongoing evaluation, I think, is not just, is not just um, 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 short-sighted. It can be absolutely detrimental to our efforts. And that brings me to the last one and my last point overall, um, the idea that, that uh, the social and, and political dynamics surrounding scientific issues, once we understood them, we don't really have to do anything else because they're pretty much the same. Um, and that's an equally, I think, dangerous assumption for us to make. Um, and I just put four technologies up here, obviously, um, uh, that, that, are, that, that I'll talk about in a second. But before I get there, I think one thing that's really important, yes, things are changing, and I, that's the takeaway from this slide, but there is a growing body and a very large body already of, of established social science research that tells us about the principles and mechanisms behind science communication. And we'll spend the next two days teasing out and, and hearing about some of the most innovative and, 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 and state-of-the-art work in this area. So that's certainly one of the key takeaways. Yes, there is a body of knowledge, and yes, there are principles that, that apply across all of these issues. But we also see a lot of variations, number one, and rapid, rapid changes, number two, across these different technologies. A, in terms of simply the, 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 the types of technologies that we're dealing with, um, but also the ethical, legal, and social concerns that surround them. Uh, meaning an ethical, legal, and social concern for, let's say, GMO was very different from what we see for nuclear after Fukushima. Um, or what we see for nano is very different than what we saw for stem cell research. Again, there may be overlaps, but the political and social dynamics, and this is again a lot of what we'll be talking about in day two, are very, very different in many ways. And then the last one, of course, that changes, and we'll talk about this as well, are the political environments. Um, we'll have a panel of science advisors who will talk about the changes in political environments. And we'll also have presentations on how, the new, how new communication environments, and they're not that new anymore, but emerging online environments have completely changed or are completely changing how people use scientific information, how they use information that is embedded socially in, in, in social networks with like buttons and so on and so forth surrounding articles. So that brings me to, to the last point um, really quickly. I think we, and that is, the, the, I think, hopefully one of the most important outcomes of, of, of this colloquium is, is that we all debate and think about the, what I would call the, the need for institutional capacity, capacity building in this area. Uh, I think there's a lot of very good research that's happening in different places. Um, but two things I think are particularly important, and we'll hear, I think, uh, people, especially in the bold proposal session and at, at the very end of this colloquium, talk much more uh, in depth about these things, but I want to highlight two. Number one, the idea that we need ongoing social science surrounding these technologies. So sustained efforts, not just ad hoc efforts here and there, 
where we do a survey here or maybe a focus group there or a few experiments around another technology. But new technologies, for, the, for exactly the reasons that I outlined at the very beginning, the absolute importance of science for global leadership of the US, um, we need these ongoing social science efforts. And we need to figure out a way to do it. And we need to figure out a way to do it by tying social science and building infrastructures, formalized infrastructures between the social and the natural sciences. And the National Science Foundation, I think, has, has done a very good job trying to do this already in some of the centers that they've funded recently um, that can serve as a model. But there's certainly, I think, much more to be, to be thought about and much more to, uh, to be done in terms of establishing those infrastructures. So hopefully, the next couple of days will get us a little bit closer to that goal and will allow us to, to think and debate some of these steps a little bit more. Um, and with that, um, I thank you very much again for being here, and I look forward to the questions.